Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI clients, referrals, and strategic partners through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25media.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Chris Yang is formally trained as an organic chemist. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Southern California and an MS Management from Changgung University in Taiwan. He started his career in the pharmaceutical industry, but soon discovered a passion for food, turned his science knowledge into cooking techniques, and started on his journey as a chef. Since then, he's been featured on the Food Network along with some other channels. He's built a tech-inspired culinary incubator and has been recognized for his work in cannabis culinary arts. He also has a passion for entrepreneurship and is currently building Pop Cultivate, a chef-driven culinary group that is focused on scientifically infusing cannabis into their cuisine. Chris, thanks so much for joining me. How are you? Doing well, Chad. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, you've got a you've got a very interesting background. So when you first got your degree in biochemistry, what were your career goals? Um, I was on my way uh, to being a doctor. Um, I wanted to be a surgeon, specifically plastic surgery. Um, just had a fascination for how things worked and super technical skills. And um, somewhere along the way, I uh, realized I can transfer those interests into food and uh, working with my hands there. So I mentioned that you were in the pharmaceutical industry. What did you do then when you first got out of school? Yeah, so uh, I got out of school and I was working for a company called Pfizer. I guess uh, people know them quite well for their vaccines these days. But I was doing some business development in uh, in their China market at the time. And um, we were figuring out how to sell vitamins actually to the local market. And um, it's very interesting things, uh, very different field than what I kind of went to school for. But I understood the science and I understood their products quite well because of that background. Why did you pursue an MS management? Um, it was uh, along that same career path. Um, I thought, you know, after working at Pfizer for a little bit, uh, what better way to understand and, you know, figure out how to sell more pharmaceuticals than to work in a hospital and understand, you know, the inner management of how, how hospitals work, how prescriptions work and how their relationship to pharmacies and all that. So I got into hospital management to kind of learn that structure and, kind of develop more relationships in that field. So then as far as I can tell, you discovered kind of a, a couple of passions of yours, food and entrepreneurship. How did those, how did you stumble across those or did, or did you have, <laughs> did you have those for a while? And then you just decided, you know, this is what I truly like. Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I now in hindsight, it was very obvious. Um, but at the time I had no idea that that's the path that I was going down. Um, as a kid, I've always been super infatuated with how food works. I've always been very curious and always loved to eat foods and like different foods and all kinds of like weird things like, hey, that cuisine, never tried that. Let me give that a try. Oh, that root vegetable I've never seen. Like, what does that taste like? So I've always had that natural curiosity for food. Um, I've never cooked food at all. My parents didn't cook much food either um, up until maybe college when I moved into a dorm and it was the first time I had a kitchen and I started tinkering with it. But that passion for cooking food and understanding and beginning that, you know, the path to that 10,000 hours started while I was in Taiwan, actually at grad school. Um, I was very into fitness and health at the time and um, really wanted to, uh, get on a regimented, healthy 
meal plan. And that led to me cooking all the time and just meal prepping by myself. And as I was doing it, um, I was just kind of so obsessed with this idea of, okay, well, how do I do this better? How do I do this faster? Like there has to be a better way like, of doing it. And it actually started with one single YouTube video. It was Gordon Ramsay's um, video on how to cut an onion, how to dice an onion. And I watched it and I tried it. And I was like completely blown away, completely amazed. I was like, wow, like there is a way of doing it. Somebody's figured it out. And from that video, like literally that day, I watched that video, did it, you know, chopped up like three or four onions. I'm like, this is amazing. And then just scoured the internet for more of this kind of content, just trial and error. What made a video about chopping an onion so captivating? Um, like at, at the beginning of cooking, you know, and, and I'm sure at a certain point in time, like everyone's kind of struggled with this, you know, like how, how do you actually cut an onion? It's like slippery there's layers on it you cut it this way it kind of falls apart and you're like you should, you should didn't know like how do i actually handle this thing so to find out that wow there's actually a technique um in doing this task it's just kind of like a light bulb went on and i'm like super technical everything i do is like very technique driven and that just kind of like i just like found this thread that i just kept pulling on and pulling on and that was the beginning of it that cut that onion chopping video <laughs> so you you watch the onion chopping video i'm sure there was more that went there was more that went into your decision to you know leave your job in the phar- some pharmaceutical industry what yeah. kind of brought you down that path where you were just like i'm going for it yeah it was uh that was probably like you know that that kind of let me to start cooking and understanding and like developing techniques and just better understanding how to do this thing called cooking and after about two years of my grad school, I finished, um, I probably by then put in about like two, maybe 3000 hours in, in the kitchen, just like cooking, cleaning, like figuring out how things worked. And, um, at the end of my graduate degree, I was in uh, Taiwan at the time. And I just thought like, there has to be more to, you know, what I do than learning how to manage hospitals. And it was kind of a really uh, important uh, moment for me because in when I was studying organic chemistry in my undergrad, I've always had this idea of, you know, I want to be a doctor and hospitals are a life-saving institute. And, you know, when you need help, you go to the hospital and doctors will help you. And having spent two years in a hospital um, from the, you know, seeing it through the lens of a management perspective and PLs and costs, it kind of ruined this idea of hospital for me. It was like, so it's this, this like pure, like helpful, like goodness of like hospital kind of ruined it for me. And all I saw were like dollar signs and processes and Hey, like this procedure, you're only supposed to be using five causes. And every time you use more, there's like, well, there's a cost. So it, it kind of ruined this idea for me. And, um, I, uh, on this like, you know, soul searching road, um, kind of came back to Los Angeles from Taiwan and was hanging out here for a little bit. It was close to like the bottom of the recession at the time and was hanging out in Los Angeles and just kind of doing some soul searching. And in the meantime, was just doing a lot of cooking still and enjoying myself and being healthy and fit. And one day a friend of mine said, Hey, you have you heard of this thing called Instagram? Hey, you should start one. You, you know, you make some cool foods, you start posting those photos. And I didn't think too much about it at the time, but um, you know, I just thought it'd be cool to have a place to catalog all the different food items that I made. And in case like one day someone's like, Hey, can you make this? I'm like, Yeah, I can. Here's my menu, and just like all the items. And that just led to more and more followers. And I just kept posting and I'm like, Oh, that's cool. I got some more followers today. And it just kind of grew. And, you know, one day after another, one day I just woke up and I had a lot of followers. <laughs> was there any particular food item or video that really like catapulted it or was it kind of just steady growth? No, it's steady growth. That's kind of what I learned 
um, about life and entrepreneurship at all, you know, in all together, it's literally one step at a time. Like what you do today is going to impact what tomorrow looks like. And just one foot forward, just one step at a time, slow and a uh, slow growth. But sure. Speaking, so speaking of entrepreneurship, you're, as we, as I mentioned, you're, you're building the pop cultivate lifestyle, but you've also had some other interesting entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, the ones I'm aware of are zip chops and little meals. Can you tell me just a little bit about those? Yeah, um, zip chops and little meats. Um, I'm sorry, zip little chops. Meats. Yeah, sorry. yeah, no worries. Um, little meats was an interesting. It was like more about um, culture and people, while zip chops was more about like technology and like you know developing in this like new space. Um, so zip chops was about. Um, leveraging delivery infrastructure and at the time we were just seeing the beginnings of this industry called food technology right and doordash just raised the series b um maybe going on series c and then there was a company called sprig and spoon rocket those are all what i call like first gen like food tech companies now you know these things exist as like postmates doordash you know grubhub and uber eats but um, that was like very fascinating to me to that technology had entered the food space. And um, it's been around for a little bit, but that was like when we're, you know, big like VC money was coming in, like, hey, how do we, how do we disrupt this thing? Um, so I kind of, with the friend, put together this idea that a restaurant is, is a brand and it is you can disassociate that brand with a physical brick and mortar space. Um, you know, traditionally you would go to a restaurant and that restaurant had a brick and mortar space that you would go to, to dine in, or, you know, even when you're ordering food, you're ordering from this brick and mortar. So once we kind of separated the concept of physical space and brand, I realized that I can run you know, for all intents and purposes, the restaurant out of my home kitchen and exist as a online virtual brand that people would order on Grubhub. So um, essentially it's the beginnings of a ghost kitchen, <laughs> which is a pretty common thing right now as well. But um, yeah, I was running a restaurant out of my home kitchen and Postmates came along and they had this, you know, you can call a Postmate to come do any kind of delivery. So I, you know, Sign contract with them and was running a restaurant out of my home kitchen, just delivering food out of my apartment. And it was very interesting. My uh, neighbors were very confused as to why I had 10 delivery drivers lined up outside my door <laughs> waiting for me to you know, give them these packages. Um, and that was about four years ago, five years ago now. Um, it was quite a while ago. Yeah. And the Little Meats? Little Meats was, was about people. Um, we uh, gathered a bunch of chefs together in this community where we incubated individual chef brands while leveraging the collective, like, I guess, labor efforts of putting on these like pop-up dinners. So it's kind of like a, like a supper club, but um, it kind of came out as a supper club where we would do regular events or we sold tickets, people showed up for it. And then um, we would have a roster of chefs that we would kind of incubate. They come in and or grow the individual chef brand along with the Little Meats like Supper Club brand and um, kind of went from there and kind of led to some interesting things with partnerships and individuals like, like kind of catapulting and like growing this like massive following. Um, and we were kind of like transferring knowledge as I was growing my like following and it got to a point where they were like 50 or 60,000, maybe like 80,000 followers on Instagram. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like this is how you do it. And we we're just passing that knowledge and incubating other chefs and getting them to that point as well. So now you're the founder of and owner of Pop Cultivate built out of your passions for science and food. What is Pop Cultivate exactly? Uh, so Pop Cultivate kind of it's a culmination of like everything that I've done in the past, um, my science background um, and this like creative foods and like, you know, very forward thinking styles of foods that I can make in the form of a supper club. 
um, kind of all mashed together with one and we throw in an element of like art and people and community and it's kind of what it is. It kind of came about when um, I was first starting to learn how to do these like supper clubs and like multi-course meals, like five, six, seven courses. And I would always have, you know, a group of friends come over. It's like, hey, I, I, you know, you guys be patient. Like, I'm trying to figure out how to do this thing. And they would just all sit around and hang out. And the first couple of times I was like, cool, dinner's at seven o'clock. And everyone gets there at seven o'clock. And I'm like, you know, like going crazy in the kitchen, like figuring out how to execute this thing. And I probably wouldn't feed my my friends until probably like close to nine, 10 o'clock at night because I sh- couldn't, didn't know how to, you know, prep ahead of time and do all those, you know, the kitchen execution. But, you know, by like dinner number two or three, one of my friends and, you know, in the meantime, very patient, they're all you know, just smoking some joints, hanging out on balcony, just chin chatting. One of my friends asked me, he's like, hey, um, can you put some of this weed into the food? I'm like, hmm, that's an interesting question. Let me get back to you on that. And then it took me about like a week, two weeks of just like scratching my brain. Like, how do I actually do this? How do I extract it? How do I put it in? How do I measure, you know, dosages? How do I deliver dosages? So it was a combination of science and kitchen operations, as well as, you know, this like front of house service, like these three things had to balance for me to be able to deliver a precise exact dose and control that dose for everyone across the board. So it was like a little pet, you know, pet project that I was just kind of like kept picking at it and like scratching it and making like a little trial and then, okay, well that didn't work and trial again, you know, that didn't work. And uh, kind of came about from there. Um, now it's a, uh, you know, a special events catering company and we do um, uh, ticketed events for people who are interested in mostly a lot of private private events, a lot of birthday parties, people doing celebratory things with their friends and family and um, kind of exists in that realm at this very moment. So it's cannabis infused food. Um, I know cannabis has THC and CBD. What would be an expectation of somebody? How will their state change when eating one of your dishes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So this experience is a um usually somewhere a five to ten course fine dining meal um they're all unique menus because i've kind of retained this idea that i want to be able to create menus and to cook whatever i really want so that's a piece that i absolutely love so there's like this element of surprise when you kind of come in and not knowing what you're going to eat and you know and just knowing that i'm going to give you the best thing possible um and throughout the five to 10 courses, we offer optional infusion. So anybody can opt in and out of cannabis infusion as they please. Um, the trick with that is we, uh, I made a proprietary um, tincture that is very fast acting, um, which I figured out is the way to go. Um, and at the end of the course, we aim to give you a high that's equal to a beer buzz of three or four beers. Um, and you know, we've tried using numbers and dosages and all that, and it just doesn't quite work out the same way. And so I kind of adopt the same system that alcohol uses, use standard, standard doses, standard serving alcohol servings. You know, you don't talk about how many proof or how many milligrams or milliliters of alcohol is in a beer. Um, you kind of talk about, you know, standard alcohol beverages. So we kind of adopted that model and it's been working out pretty well for us, but about three or four um, beers worth of a uh, high like buzz is what we aim for. Does uh, cannabis infusion significantly alter the taste of a, trad- a dish that you might have without cannabis in it? Yeah, so um, it absolutely doesn't. Um, I've created it so the tincture is odorless and tasteless. So it just gives you the effects, the psychotropic effects you would feel with THC without any of the taste or smells of it. And it would just be enjoying a very tasty meal. So I've watched some of these shows, you know, on the Food Network. I've actually seen you compete in some of these shows where, you know, chefs are given a certain number of ingredients maybe that don't go together and they somehow masterfully combine them and make some incredible dish. Does your, how does your science background help you do that? I know when I hear them talk, they say like, I add the acidity of this, you know, I just know that cilantro goes well in guacamole, <laughs> but I don't know all the, everything that, everything about that. How does your science background help you? 
Yeah, I guess it's more um, it's more about like the science background and training and understanding really molded um, the way I think about things. Um, very, very analytical and technical. And it's very much like a chemist. Um, to me, every, you know, every flavor or taste or ingredient is broken down to smaller pieces all the way down to a molecule. So, um, you know, the way like cilantro, for example, works is there's the, the flavors of it and then the actual fibers of it and the, you know, what you can turn that into, whether it's like a powder or a juice and oil, or, you know, you can dry it into dust and you can kind of change the form of what this thing is, but ultimately at the core of it, like what is cilantro, what the, you know, what are the things in it that actually make it cilantro? So being able to break things down and understand in my mind, these ingredients and, dishes and flavors like what is composed what composes those things and how do i break it down to its individual elements is kind of where that science lives in my head and how it impacts and influences all my food is there a significant difference in your cannabis infused um food today than maybe there was when your friends first decided to or encouraged you to try the idea um absolutely um I can first definitely speak to the, uh, you know, my, my culinary technique and level. It's definitely grown significantly in every dinner, every event that I put on. Um, I learn a little bit more and kind of refine my skills a little bit more. It's like sharpening a knife. It's just a little bit sharper, a little bit better every time. Um, the style of cuisine has changed my understanding of, like what components need to be on a dish has changed to be able to deliver, you know, this, this high experience. So it's, uh, it's really forced me to change or learn and understand um, how food works and how people interact with food and what are the different components of food. So you had had some entrepreneurship experience before, but uh, in the early days of pop cultivate, what were those, what were those days like? Oh man, those are rough. Um, you know, it's, I, I kind of equate, it, it's not, I've always thought about it as a building a catering business, but it's not quite the same because you, it, it's a product that people don't know about and they don't know that they want. And once they kind of get a flavor for it, they're like, this is absolutely amazing, but I had no idea this exists. Um, so it was a lot of it's very strategic, but it was very time consuming and tiring, but I had to build, not only did I have to build a brand um, in this space, I actually had to build the entire space because this was not a thing. Like people did not go seek cannabis, fine dining. And at the time when I started it, um, we started with what we call the, you know, the more advanced users. <laughs> um, they're kind of more enthused cannabis enthusiasts and they got a kick out of it because it was like, wow, this is a new way of consuming cannabis. This is phenomenal. And then as time went on, now we're kind of shifting gears a little bit and we're seeing a lot of first timers and recreational users, things like that. Just be like, wow, we want to try cannabis, but never, you know, didn't like the experience of smoking or going, you know, eating an edible or gummy. And this was just a, a much more refined way of consuming cannabis along with this kind of communal dining style, which is a huge element of lifestyle and uh, this community factor um, in consuming cannabis. So you said those first few years or, you know, the first, your first few years probably of um, operating yeah. pop cultivate were rough. When did you feel like things were starting to be not so rough and what were some of the turning points? Do you think? Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was really just a, you know, a, um, I guess a market thing. Um, it was, it was rough in that I had to create my own business. Like I had to like sell this idea to somebody. And then after they're like, that's kind of a cool idea. Then I got to sell them and get their business of spending money on this thing. Um, the turning point was about, I would probably say about two or three years ago, um, where there was like, this mass shift of acceptance and um, how cannabis was perceived in society as a recreational, you know, uh, vice, I guess you can call it now. Um, 
people started smoking cannabis and being okay with it. And then the, you know, the, not just like the younger generation, but like the older generation who have actually been consuming cannabis for a very long time now are very open about consuming cannabis. And then when that kind of happened, I felt this like massive shift in society where everyone's like, cannabis is cool now. It's okay. It's accepted. And then that's when like, you know, I started feeling this like natural push of like organic traffic. People started seeking out um, this kind of experience. And even to this day, like I would say close to hundred percent of my business is organic traffic, literally people Googling cannabis, fine dining and boop and dropping onto my website. Um, the TV shows helped a lot as well to, um, just give so much exposure because, and again, that was just an indication of what society wanted. Now they want this kind of cannabis content. They want to see what else you can do with cannabis and, uh, yeah, that was, it was like a massive like swing, like almost overnight, you could say. Did COVID affect Pop Cultivate at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, much like any any other food industry, I guess minus, you know, food technology delivery, um, it, it slowed things down for a lot of people. Um, you know, people were not doing massive gatherings and birthday parties and things like that. So we kind of went dormant for a little bit. Again, you know, given that we we're, we exist as a catering business. Um, you know, we just kind of like laid low for a little while. Um, it would definitely hurt, um, kind of sucks to be honest, but, uh, now we're kind of coming back out of it and people are, you know, back at it looking for dinners and celebrations and looking to get back to what, you know, a normal pre COVID life would look like. Did it change the way you guys do business or is it, or did you just kind of survive it and wait until things could get back to normal? Um, we just kind of waited it out a little bit. Um, we tried, uh, some more contents, uh, just kind of keep it top of mind for everybody that we kind of existed, but it was more, the push was more so after COVID, you know, we weathered it through and then now things are kind of coming back and we're like, Hey guys, we made it. We're still around. <laughs> Come do dinner with us. You know? you know, I've talked to, um, several entrepreneurs and, and chefs and uh, some of the most valuable moments, especially early on is maybe like a, a mistake that they made that uh, they learned so much from that they never make again. And then they built off what they learned. Was there any, you know, big prep um, pitfalls or mistakes that you learned from? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, I think this is probably very unique to my business. Um, very early on, I put in a lot of effort and I pushed the growth of Pop Cultivate like very hard. And if I can put in like, you know, like 50% and gain like 1% growth, like I will do it. Um, somewhere along the way, I learned that there's this, you know, rule, this 80 20 rule where um, there's a certain amount of effort you can actually push into it. But after a while, like, is that? effort actually worth it. Maybe you can redirect that energy elsewhere and you put in maybe, you know, 2% and you'll see the same kind of growth. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I learned with pop Holtzway and realized that this is kind of like a waiting game. And after seeing that, Hey, two or three years, that first, the beginning of it, I pushed so hard for the growth, but literally it was like an overnight swing when society changed that's when I saw like that uptick. So seeing that and having experienced that, I kind of realized, understand like, Hey, some things like you just have to let it kind of do its own thing. You put in your time and effort and let it go, but you know, you don't want to, you know, just floor it on this one project and just keep burning out for that little incremental growth and just let it do its thing. Yeah, sure. I think that's good advice for mo for everybody. You want to get a return on your effort and not just fry yourself before you can get the return before the return is even possible. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I see on your website that Pop Cultivate has three locations. Is that right? Yeah, we're um, we recently didn't um, we pushed for an expansion. So uh, we're based in Los Angeles. Um, now we're in Denver and uh, Las Vegas as well too. Um, we're just kind of moving around to seeing where uh, what other um, you know communities and local cities would uh would enjoy our product and uh seems like denver and las vegas are the ones yeah. and these are physical they're physical pop cultivate locations 
No, so we, we kind of continue to exist in um, like catering form. We'll do pop-ups, we'll do ticketed events, mm -hmm. but our, our bread and butter is uh, catered events, um, like birthday parties. That's for some odd reason, that's the one. Okay. Yeah. What are some of your goals for the future professionally and you know how, how you can personally apply to those? Yeah. Um, goal for future. Uh, I, I've always had this vision of what pop cultivate will be and, um, pop cultivate in the future will be a boutique hotel, um, a cannabis friendly community boutique hotel. Um, because what's actually special about pop cultivate, you know, the food is great. Cannabis is cool. Um, and it's a very unique experience, but at the end of the day, it's, it's about that community. It's the pop culture community and, you know, who you sit next to at that dinner table is like-minded, you know, you connect because everyone's there to enjoy this unique cannabis experience. And that's, uh, the, the, uh, the future for pop culture. And I'm excited to, uh, realize that future soon. Very exciting. Uh, a couple final questions for you. We're big fans of gratitude around here. We like to give people the chance to publicly acknowledge people who have been influential to you. Um, who are some of those people in the industry, industry that you respect and have helped you along the way? Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is such a new industry. Um, you know, cannabis itself, you know, not just cannabis foods that it's uh it, it was hard to find somebody to look up to or you know follow a path or mimic something it was literally day in day out of grinding and like walking around in the dark um kind of finding my way so the um you know i, I have to uh give gratitude to my family my brother and my mom they um they were there to support me um in this like crazy venture that you know crazy path and journey that i decided to go down and um, you know, it, it wasn't about looking forward to like, Hey, what is next? Like what's down the road and how do I get there? It's literally like people around me keeping me going like, Hey, just keep walking just keep walking and just like blindly walking to this like dark abyss to kind of see where the end of the path is. Are you still putting, um, videos out there on social media? Um, a little bit uh, here and there, um, a little bit less uh, content being out there. Um, I think we're going to probably turn that machine back on now that, you know, that the, the world is opening back up and we're seeing some normalcy again, but definitely going to turn that machine back on and create some more content. Is there a place maybe people, if people were curious, even just to see your old videos, you, you mentioned Instagram, is there a place they can check you out? Yeah, the um, the website popcultivate.com, um, popcultivate.com is a, a great place for all the uh, you know the content. We got all the uh, the TV shows. There's a couple of amazing um, episodes that we've done. Some with like Roy Choi, uh, a couple on Amazon, Amazon Prime, and like Netflix. There's some great content there. But um, the majority of all the photos and videos and everything else uh, lives on Instagram. What was it like to compete in those TV shows? Those have really kind of gained steam and popularity over the past few years. Um, yeah, the TV show is, is a different world. Um, it's very different. Like a TV kitchen is very different than like a restaurant kitchen. Um, but, you know, I go in lighthearted. Um, I'm just there to have some fun. And uh, I, I always have a lot of fun. Um, the competition is great. Um, I, uh, I live on this mantra, especially when I'm competing, I'm a very competitive person that not only do I want to win, I want to make sure everyone else knows that they lost. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <Yeah. So. laughs> very nice. Um, hey, Chris, it was great talking to you. Give us your website one more time. Popcultivate.com. Okay, perfect. Hey, thanks so much for joining me, Chris. It was great talking to you and it was great hearing your story. Thank you so much, Chad. It's a pleasure being here. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.